welcome everyone to Open Air. This is CDR. I'm very pleased to have you here with us today. Um, this is CDR is a event series that we at Open Air are putting on to explore the wide range of CDR solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for uh, policy proposals under development in New York and other states. I'm Toby Bryce, and I work on CDR policy advocacy with Open Air and based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, everyone, please introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're Zooming in from. I'm very pleased to have you here with us today. Um, quick background on Open Air. We are a distributed volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of CDR solutions essential to solving the climate crisis. Um, we're a global community, and we work together on shared open source missions in the areas of research and development, policy advocacy, and activist market and business development. Quick background on CDR. Many of you are familiar, obviously, but just to set the stage, um, CDR means an activity that removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and durably stores it in a geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoir or in long-lived products. Um, it's important whenever we're talking about CDR, as we are at the series, to like emphasize first and foremost that that CDR is in no way a substitution for uh, decarbonizing our economy and reducing emissions as quickly as possible, full stop. Um, you have to do that first. That said, CDR um, is going to be essential to uh, getting us to net zero. Um, the latest IPCC report emphasizes that every credible climate forecast um, shows that CDR will be required at gigaton scale, that's billions of tons per year by mid-century, to counteract the emissions that are difficult or inequitable to abate. And ultimately, we're going to want to start removing the tremendous excess of anthropogenic CO2 already in the atmosphere so we can restore our climate to a healthier state. A couple of good resources about CDR. CDR. Um, there's, a, there's a picture there of the CDR primer. We're going to put a few other um, articles and resources that we like in the chat if you want to read up on them. And then, of course, the series is designed to explore CDR. So um, all of the past episodes are recorded and available on our YouTube channel. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Christoph. We're very excited today to have uh, Christoph Boitler from Climeworks here um, to tell us about what's going on with Climeworks and all the exciting developments with the company. Christoph, why don't you uh, go ahead and take it away? Uh, thank you so much, Toby, and, and thanks for, for having me. So uh, thanks for having me. I've been, I've been asked to introduce um, Climeworks Direct Air Capture and, and maybe place it into the, to the context of, of negative emissions, why it's needed, um, and, and maybe a bit on, on our positions on, on, on other CDR solutions. Um, and I'll probably get into business models as well, uh, scale-up requirements, and touch on policy at the end and I'll keep it short and we can have uh, questions um, for about 40 minutes. I won't take longer than 20, I guess. Okay, so um, that's our goal. Our goal is to inspire 1 billion people to remove carbon dioxide from the air. And, and why is, is that the case? Um, I'll let you know in a sec, but I wanna, I wanna talk to you about our technology First, so, so at Climeworks, we have developed um, a two-step process with which we can remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, you know, in, in the first phase, we pull CO2 through a filter using renewable e electricity. Um, and that filter is highly selective and it only selects for CO2. And because we're chasing 410 parts per million, we have to pull uh, a lot of air through. Once the, the filter is saturated, we then um, can heat it to, to 100 degrees Celsius under vacuum, and that releases the chemical bond between the filter and the CO2. Um, and then we get a almost pure stream of CO2, and then we can start the, the cycle uh, anew. Why is that so important? Why is it so important to be able to desorb at 100 degrees Celsius so at the boiling point of water? Well, it, it enables us to use either waste, heat, or renewable um, energy. And if you are in the business of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, um, you, you better keep your emissions low or as low as possible. And that's why we're super proud of this, because this enables us to you know, do this on renewables and waste heat only and not use fossil uh, energy. So... Um, the, we have two kind of broad legs we stand on. One is a CDR, the other is obviously utilization. Uh, so this, this webinar is for CDR, so I'll, I'll, I'll go more into detail here. Um, so 
the way we lock the CO2 away safely and permanently is via mineralization. Um, we can do other routes. We can also do sequestration, but we have started uh, and we've just opened the world's largest um, plant in Iceland. We have started this three years ago with, with Carp Fix, um, an Icelandic company who, who have developed a methodology to mineralize underground. So basically we use um, here, we use hot water um, from, a, from a nearby geothermal power plant and also the, the electricity. So that's the waste heat and the energy um, to pull CO2 out of the air. And then we, we use water again, can be seawater because we need a lot of it. It doesn't have to be fresh water. That was just demonstrated to mix the CO2 with and, and pump it underground into uh, basaltic rock formations. They're porous. And um, due to the, to the kind of heat, the pressure, the minerals in the ground, the CO2 mineralizes within about two years. Um, it's a naturally occurring process that usually takes tens of thousands of years or 10,000 years or thousands of years. And, and our partners at Carfix have been able to speed it up to just uh, two years, which is, which is great. And, and why is that so important? Because it is, you know, anybody can initially understand without, without specialist knowledge that this, it, that this is a safe form of storage. So the CO2 is gone, it's gone for forever basically. And, you know, even if we have an earthquake uh, or volcanic eruption, that the CO2 is locked away. And that's, that's very important to us. Um, so why do we want to inspire 1 billion people? Well, all of you know that I'm, I'm preaching to the convinced. Um, we need to get our missions down fast and, and not only get them down, but also scale up negative emissions to basically defossilize, to neutralize unavoidable emissions and to ultimately realize net negative emissions. So if we, if we make it to net zero globally at, in 2050, so mid-century, we have already borrowed from the future and we have to enter a period of net negative afterwards. By the way, that business as usual line is very wrong here. That is already more ambitious climate policy than we have uh, currently globally. So uh, we have to change that. Bit. So this is Orca. This is, this is the plant we launched um, about, I think two or three weeks ago in Iceland, which is a very beautiful country, by the way. Uh, go go if you can. Um, it's part of it. It's a bit bigger than that. I think this is half of it. And you see at the bottom, you see uh, Jan and Christoph, our founders. And um, yeah, this is this is now the world's largest um, direct air capture and and storage plant at four thousand tons. It's nothing. It's a tiny drop in the ocean, but it is the technology that we will be able to scale this on uh, to to gigaton scale. Basically, that this is possible from a from a technological perspective. Um, maybe a bit more we, we, about us. Uh, we don't just have Orca. Um, we started in uh, 2009. We have now 15 direct air capture facilities um, scattered across Europe from very you know, northern parts of, 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 of the continent to, to and, and including Iceland to, to the southern parts. So lots of climatic uh, conditions. Uh, many, many hours of operational experience. Um, we're already at 10% life cycle emissions. Uh, some are at, at five, uh, and, and this is, has just started. Um, we think we can get lower, but I want to stress here that this is cradle to grave from you know, making the steel to build the plant, to operate it, to recycling at the end. So the, the, the complete uh, chain of emissions is calculated within these uh, 10%. Um, that presentation is two months old, so I think we're 180 now. We're growing fast, um, and it, we have the largest team on direct air capture in, in the world. Um, and yeah, we, we're super excited about this, uh, but we're also very excited um, that others are now joining us. I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, quickly, want to uh, look at our roadmap. So, so we have 15 plants now. We have Orca. We, this is the technology we, we're going to base our next few generations on. Obviously, we, we are indeeing multiple generations and, and TRL levels at the same time um, because we, we want to be fast. That's, that's basically the bottleneck scaling, the scale-up rate that's needed. But the next plant we're building um, will be, in 2024, will be 40,000 tons. It's called Mammoth. And then we will build uh, one at, at 400,000 tons. And then we're kind of trying to, to roll it out into multiple 
locations. We will also be selling smaller plants in, in a new program uh, that's going to be up and running in, in two years. So for those of you who are looking to decentralized DAC, we have something coming. Um, yeah, as I said, we are growing family. We're super excited. Uh, it used to be the, what we now call the big three. It used to be Climeworks Carbon Engineering and Global Thermostat, um, of which we are by far the largest. And, and now uh, a lot of other companies in, in direct air capture have joined us and we are super excited about this because we need to build an industry uh, that's eventually bigger, gonna be bigger than, than oil and gas. Um, obviously we're not saying we can keep on emitting. So I already said emissions need to come down. We are there for the unavoidables and to provide feedstocks for, for defossilized hydrocarbon chains. Um, and, but we need everything else in the CDR space as well. We need afforestation, we need bags, we need enhanced weathering, but they have, especially the bio-based ones have, have large land footprints um, and, and we are very space efficient. So I think, again, it's a portfolio, everything's needed and we bring different things to the table than afforestation, but uh, it is clear that we won't make it with afforestation alone. We need basically three, three planets for that. Um, we also sell to private individuals and, and companies. So, so I think, again, that's two weeks ago. I think the number today we hit was 9,000. Um, we're not advertising this very much because we're using the money for something else. But um, again, maybe I can do that now. So if you're excited about this, join us. Um, I'm, I'm passionate about classic cars. I have a, an old uh, English roadster. And I'm, off, I'm removing the emissions from that car with my Climeworks subscription um, because I, I can, you know, abstain from a lot of things, but I, li I like driving that car a few times a year. Um, also, I think it's now uh, CDR or, you know, direct air capture is going mainstream. Elon Musk um, announced a big price on it. Bill Gates is, is supporting it also in terms of policy. Um, him and Ursula von der Leyen, the European president, have announced the EU Catalyst program, uh, of which direct air capture is one of the four tracks that receive funding at 250 million uh, between now and 2026. That all sounds a lot and it's great. And don't get me wrong, we were super excited, but it, it's, it's, still, it's still not enough. We need, we need more to, to get to gigaton scale. Um, the, 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 then, after the individuals and the high net worth individuals, the next track I would call the demand side. So there are a growing number of, of companies and we are super excited about this to realize that if they don't drive the scale up, it's probably gonna to be too late. And uh, this slide doesn't contain the numbers, but the, the deals have been growing. Uh, the numbers of the deals have been growing bigger from for, with every deal. So I think we started with one million with Stripe and we are now at 10 million with uh, Swiss Re and have Audi, Shopify, Microsoft and Economist Group in between and obviously with the economist also comes the benefit of having a media outlet that is very high quality and talks about it. Um, but it, it, more than that, the, the whole world almost is, is now, or at least is, is pledging to be net zero. We have, um, you know, almost 68% of the global economy with net zero commitments and very, very many countries have either binding laws or they are in, in legislation. And, Obviously, net zero is, is the starting point in policy for all of this, because then that's the point where policymakers realize, oops, we can't get to zero, we have unavoidables, and, uh, and then away we go. Um, I don't wanna go too much into policy. We can, we can have questions later uh, within this presentation, but I wanna just say that, you know, at the moment, it's about certification. The first, the first removal standards are in the making. And it's really, really, really important that we get this right, you know, that we just only incentivize proper carbon removal and have, have certificates for proper carbon removal. So the, the track on the, on the right hand side. So it has to come from the air and it has, has to end up in the ground. Otherwise, it is an avoided emission or an emissions reduction, but it's not a, a carbon removal. Again, I'm preaching to the convinced. Obviously, we, we lean towards the, the kind of permanent high quality side of things, but we also are still at, at higher prices and basically have to have built a, a Tesla Roadster and we need all of you to buy them. So one day there can be a Model 3 uh, that, that saved the world. Um, with that, I'm, I'm at the end and very happy to take questions. Thank you.
That's I'll fantastic. stop sharing my should I stop sharing my screen? Sure. Um, thank you, Christoph. That was perfect. Um, we do have a couple of prepared questions that we kind of crowdsourced from our open source our open air community. And then um, Mega is going to take the wheel and um, and answer all the audience questions. So audience, please keep your questions coming into the QA box and uh, we'll get to those in just a second. Um, but first, Christoph, since we skipped your biography. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your personal journey into climate? And when did you first hear about or learn about direct air capture? When did you first hear about Climeworks? How did you start working there? I just think people like to hear how, you know, as a leader in the space now, how you got to where you are. I don't know if I'm a leader in the space, yeah, but yeah, I'm happy to, to, to tell you uh, my, 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 my story. So I, I grew up in the 80s, I had an environmentally conscious mother growing up in Germany, and, and it was a big topic, you know, the, the forest dying and everything. And, and so as a kid, that, that was on my consciousness. And, and I think in school, I kind of went towards the kind of startup path and bit, bit for a while, but it, I always, it always interested me. And then I, after, after uni, I, well, first I had a startup, then I went to uni and then after that, I went to 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 consulting, so so the digital marketing consulting, which you know I think we had. I worked as a spin-off of Saatchi and Saatchi. We had I think Twitter account 140, so it was super exciting. But after two years, I decided, okay, I wanna I wanna I don't want a job. I I don't want what I want to do something useful. And then I went back to uni, taught sustainability in London for for a very long time, and 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 then came to Switzerland for private reasons because of my wife. And uh, yeah, basically decided I'm again worked in a consultancy and then again decided I want to work in this space. So I, I quit my job. I worked as a mechanic for nine months um, and applied and I made a vow that I will just do, you know, this space and, and, and uh, started as a, at a think tank. And uh, the first project we had was, was for the Swiss government to establish um, a, a science dialogue on, on, on back then it was called geoengineering so it was cdi and srm mixed together um and i remember at uni i came across paul crutzen's paper in 2006 and, and and it was kind of there all the time and then i looked at the data i looked at the numbers and i thought okay it's obvious it's clear what we need to do and 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 then i decided to go full steam ahead did a few projects with that think tank i'm still with it um and, and we have just launched the Swiss carbon removal platform. So we do active policy work uh, in Switzerland. Um, but after we, we got it into the Swiss net zero goal, I, I, call, I basically called Jan and said, I think, I think so one of our founders, and I said, I think you need policy for this. Otherwise, you know, if, if we don't price in the externality, you, you, have, you know, you have a smaller business case and, and, and you know, Climax is not really just about money, but it, we are a company because it's quicker. Um, so yeah, that's that's the story. And then from then, I, I from there, I then founded the negative or well, helped to, to found the negative emissions platform in Brussels and 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 so forth. So, so yeah. and so you knew the Jan and the the Climeworks founders through the sort of Swiss climate TDR network. You had, you already knew them. No, no, I don't. I didn't know them. I, I just I just I just I made sure I got contact and I just called them. Got it. Very cool. Um, uh, so uh, I don't know. Past, we had a, a intro to direct air capture session. I think it was end of August with uh, Dr. Habib Azarabadi, who is at Arizona State and works with Klaus Lackner. And one of the things he talked about was a paper he and Klaus wrote called "Buying Down the Cost of Direct Air Capture." And we'll put a link to the paper in the chat because it's really, I think, very, very well done and important. Can you talk about how you see you kind of showed your roadmap over the next ten years? Can you talk about how you see your per ton cost declining from where it is now over the next decade? And sort of generally speaking, where do the opportunities for savings and cost reduction exist in your in your product and process? And what do you see are the primary bottlenecks and obstacles? Again, just from this like cost reduction perspective. Yeah. Okay. So so if we can go full steam ahead, that means not unlimited, but well funded. Uh, not unlimited money, but well funded. We can be at, you know, 200 by the end of the decade and, and, and at 100, I don't know, then it becomes harder. Somewhere 2035, 20, 2040, depends. Right. Um, the, the, the kind of, 
The problem is that the, it, it needs incredibly differentiated policies to buy down the right technologies, right? So if we do a CCS, CDR policy, lump it all together, we won't, nothing will happen, right? That's, that has happened with the EU Innovation Fund. So initially, they didn't care whether you take the CO2 from a fossil points or so from the air, and then we're chasing 410 parts per million. They tap into a concentrated flue gas stream. It's physically impossible to be cheaper. Um, so that, that's important. And so how do you design policies that, that work for everyone? but then still filter out the, the bad stuff, so to say, um, th then you have to have policies that, that work in the field where you have a surplus on biomass uh, and biomass is still cheaper, but you know that around the corner, you won't have enough. Um, so, 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 but yeah, ultimately, fundamentally, I mean, I completely agree. This needs to, we need to buy that uh, because otherwise, what will happen is we have to raise the price of, 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 of the carbon taxes towards towards 2050 so far that it will basically cripple the economy. So we, we need to invest the money now to buy it down so it is there and it's cheap and plentiful, like Germany did with wind and solar. In, in Are there specific time. like parts of your process or your product where you think the cost savings opportunities lie, whether it's the sorbent or whether it's the just learning how to do it better and purely just learning by doing? Are there, yep. are there economies of scale to any of the uh, materials that your process employs? Like, do you see specific opportunities on those, on those fronts? Yeah, so in, in, in order of the chunk that, that it will save, it's, it's CAPEX, then OPEX, then it's the process improvements and, 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 and the learning improvements from, from building the plant. And depending on how far it comes down somewhere in there, is also renewable energy prices or energy prices. Those are the four factors. Got it. Cool. Um, I feel like Climeworks is kind of a, a poster child of modularity. Um, uh, one of our members, Naeem Merchant, who's a real thought leader, I think, in the CDR space, he wrote a blog uh, a couple months ago, and we'll put a link to it in the chat, focusing on how modularity can help DAC move down the cost curve. And he kind of broke modularity out into three types. Number one, the actual unit. Um, which again, I think Climeworks is a good example of having relatively small self-contained units that you put together into a larger plant versus a large unitary industrial plant. Um, number two, within the units having modular plug and play components so that you can actually, you know, achieve economies of scale with the actual components of the unit. And then number three, modularity of business model. I think, you, again, you guys are a good example of you're really focusing on the capture and you're partnering for the sequestration. Whereas some of the other DAC startups are, are maybe trying to do both. Um, can you talk about, does this analysis make sense to you? Do you agree with it? Um, are any one of these modularities more important than the other to Climeworks business? Uh, oof, that's hard. So, so okay, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. So, so because we are modular, we can build smaller plants that therefore we can fail faster or learn faster, however you want to frame that. Um, we have 15 in the field and, and, and uh, the, the, we don't quote the other ones, the, the other direct air capture companies have demonstrators. So that's, I think, in part because of modularity, because we could tap into those niche markets earlier. And, and, and you know, a few years ago, still now, these markets are where it makes economic sense are, are small, right? Then we need to, yeah, we need to build them and ship, ship them and a lot of them. And, and then having the 40 foot container as a unit of, 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 of size is, um, I'm, I'm sorry, my, my no one year old is coming in, um, is, is uh, very, very important. But then we can also, you know, interlock with other providers in utilization. So we provide the CO2 and, and away we go for, for, for hydrocarbon chains. Um, and yeah, the business models, it, it, yeah, it enables us to, to try very many business models in a, in a very short amount of time. And this is the key, right, to get the cost down is to, to learn very fast. Yeah. And just uh, pivoting on that a little bit, you referenced this, I believe, with um, your, a new product that you're going to let third parties operate your units. Um, open air, I think, as you know, we're very keen on the idea of this distributed DAC as a key to scaling and driving DAC down the cost curve. Um, it seems like your focus currently is on, you know, they're modular, but the large centralized plants like Orca and growing those is a distributed pathway part of your model. And if so, you know, for example, like a Climeworks machine at a cement plant 
or a Climeworks machine at a brewery or a Climeworks machine at a greenhouse um, or any other sort of carbon to value enterprise so that there will be a, you know, direct local source of the CO2 that they need for their process. Is that something that Climeworks plans to support with your product? And if so, can you talk a little bit about the business model and how that would work and maybe when that might come online? Yeah, that's what I what I refer to in my presentation. So so it's not operational yet, but we plan to, you know, we, we the track one has built these bigger plants so so that we also operate. But track two is to to have a program that that kind of where we sell smaller plants. And it's exactly for that. It's it's for the all of those business cases that that you know we we can't think of and, and also probably right. don't have the capacity to to develop the smaller ones so we just mm -hmm. sell them but this requires a kind of more mature technology so we want to test it uh, completely and make sure we can we can basically sell it and and, and not, not sell it for are you thinking that would the business model would be basically a finance purchase by the end user would it be a SaaS model have you thought about what the business model would be for that we, we're thinking about various pathways, but it's, it's too early. We, we haven't decided yet. And we, we probably will try several things and see what, what flies. So you said two years. So this is sort of a 2023, 2024 time horizon. That's the plan at least. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Didn't mean to pry too much, but we're very excited. <laughs> it's all good. And, um, definitely want to be uh, stay on top of that. A um, couple more questions and then we're going to go to the break. It looks like we're getting a ton of audience questions, which is fantastic. Um, you had a slide that talked about the sort of evolution of the voluntary CDR purchase market, you know, led by folks like Stripe and Shopify and Microsoft and your, your um, compatriot Swiss Re, which is obviously critical and offered important early market support, both for Climeworks and for CDR in general. Um, I mentioned at the top, we're working on a public procurement policy really focused initially on US states, where basically as part of a state's net zero commitment, they would break out a decarbonization target and emissions reduction target, and then a CDR target and uh, for, the, for the emissions that are difficult to um, abate and have the actual states start acting like a Stripe or a Shopify and scaling up CDR purchases over time to, again, hit this net zero target, whether it's 2040, 2045, 2050. Um, does that policy make sense to you? Um, what do you think would be an important consideration for the policymakers to like make it benefit you know, climate in general, but also the, the CDR sector and help the CDR sector scale? Because that's kind of the intent to help the CDR sector scale. Yeah. Uh, so it's super simple. It, it makes a lot of sense. Um, the, the the question is how do you get the design the, the right policy with within the kind of you know the the splitting of the goals makes a lot of sense. We've been advocating that uh, two years ago already, and, and I think that's the discussion we need to have because that also gets us around the moral hazard discussion, right? We 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 have the the emissions down pathway. We have the scale up pathway done. Move on. But then the question is how do you incentivize the right technologies approaches cdr approach with within and and then you have to shift to a long-term view so otherwise you will just incentivize bio-based because they're cheaper right but but um and maybe the last thing is then to if you then don't want to cripple your economy with a very high co2 price you make a fund so so you know low co2 price that makes a fund and 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 then you can start buying the 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 promising approaches and technologies down. That's what we're advocating at the EU level at the moment, uh, because there's talks to, to have something like that, to integrate CDR in the EU emissions trading system. Um, but, but, and then you know, a fund would prevent policymakers from going after the cheapest options, because this is not about price, this is about scalability. And th this is what we need to get right. And um, yeah, I, I, so the, the policy would be, focus on removals and not anything else, whether it's a renewable energy credit or an avoided emission or, you know, in integrated forest management um, and also have a permanence threshold. And so I think the permanence threshold could kind of like help drive yeah. the right kind of CDR. If you're going to emit a ton, you need to actually remove the ton and not anything else. Yeah, I don't, I don't. I can't comment on 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 on, you know, all, all of these, these approaches. But what I want to say is I, I would very much you know, take into account that the avoided emissions credit will die in 2050 if your net zero goal is 2050 because there are yeah. no more emissions to avoid, right? So that's not a, a viable business model. 
agreed. Um, okay, one more question, and then we're going to go to the audience, um, and we're going to uh, put a link in the chat. You recently had an interview with a publication, I believe it's German-based, called Clean Energy Wire, about policy to support direct air capture and CDR, and we thought it was really great. Um, one of the approaches that you referenced uh, was feed-in tariff, um, FIT, which uh, was a um, uh, policy tool that was really, I think, critical to drive down the cost of uh, solar and PVs um, a decade or two ago in primarily in Europe, but elsewhere. Um, can you talk a little, can you maybe explain to the audience what a feed-in tariff is and talk about how that might be applicable to direct air capture and, and help the sector? Yeah, I think the the, the the English term would be, a, a, or that's used in UK policies, it's a contract for difference. So that's then a carbon contract for difference. And it simply is designed to close the gap be between the fossil product that's that we need to get rid of and the, the kind of, um, you know, new sustainable alternative. And that can be wind, solar and energy, or it can be, for example, in carbon removal, you know, the price of direct air capture over afforestation. And, and, and there are many, many, you can think of, of many, many combinations. And what you then do is you bring the amount of the, 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 the difference down over time to, to, to force the buy down. And that, that has worked well in-, in, in so For a carbon market, it would be a, it would be a policy tool that would, that would um, equilibrate the, the price of the, the, the low, the low, not low quality, but the lower priced, um, offsets with the higher quality, more permanent removals? Yeah, there are many, many combinations you can think of. I would personally, I would, I would advocate for keeping removal markets separate from avoided emissions markets uh, um, because that, that might create very many different interests and, and potentially, I think, a mess. Uh, maybe not, I don't know, but intuitively, I think it, it, it's probably better. But yeah, you can think of it's basically a, a cheap way to buy this down because at the, at the beginning, the volumes are small, prices are high, but overall the total amount will be low compared to solving this problem with, with a carbon tax, right? right. If, you, if I said that in the interview, so if you look at stakeholders who advocate carbon taxes, they usually are emitters be, and, and they do that because they know that it's very hard to have a global carbon tax and to agree on that. Look at the Paris Agreement, look what's going on there. Right. It's the same problem. Yeah, I think we a thousand percent agree that avoided emissions go into the emissions reduction column and it's a tool to reduce emissions, obviously by definition, and that offsets, quote unquote, have to be removals. If you're gonna emit a ton of CO2 in the atmosphere, you have to remove a ton. So we are on the same page. Um, Mega, are you, uh, can you pop, pop up and um, do the audience Q&A? There she is, cool. Hey, I'm back. Um, yeah, so I wanted to start with a question, which I think we touched a little bit about on the question of, you know, scale and how um, things like the cost curve changes over a course of um, 10 years with scale. And you mentioned that in 10 years, you could see it coming down to 100 or 200, depending on, you know, the amount of investment that comes in during that time period. Um, I wanted to ask, since you mentioned CapEx being kind of the main limiting factor in bringing that cost curve down, do you think that corresponds to a particular scale? So, you know, we need to reach this scale of facility in order to reach that cost curve, or is it more a question of just time? Uh, it's it's both, I would say. So, so you know, the the thing behind me was built in in, in Switzerland by hand, so one of the most expensive uh, countries in terms of, of of maybe the most in, of labor in, in cost in the world. And we need to get to an automated industrial process, very much like the car industry. And, and then it's not just making it bigger. Obviously, you know, you have economies of scale, but it's also learning and that takes time. And, and the, the quicker we can be bigger, the, the quicker we learn. So, yeah. But there's also That's a limit to, to, to kind of, it won't get to gigaton scale overnight. That's the problem with, you know, things like the integrated assessment models where, you know, you, you, you tweak the price of, of carbon and then, um, what we build falls from the sky and that, that's not right. going to happen. Yeah, okay, makes sense. We had a few questions about the distributed aspect of all of this. So one question was, how do you think about the storage aspect of it when you're thinking about a more distributed system uh, rather than kind of a centralized one? We, we map it along the sinks that are available and, and, and kind of you look at the sinks when they come on tap and that's your roadmap because we will certainly not engage in making our own sinks, at least not in the next decade because we're too small for that 
and we're not experts and it again there, there are people like carbfix or companies like carbfix with people that, that know how to do it a lot better than right me. right makes sense um and another question on the sort of the distribution side of things was asking um do you do you kind of look into those geographic considerations at all when you think about where the next project could be deployed after orca or is that also on your partners to kind of look into that no no that's us so so we look at the it's always a combination obviously of the sink and and the the funding that's available in in in, in that in that uh, country or jurisdiction mm -hmm. um and and then obviously you have local costs of building it that might be different and energy prices and but all of that goes in yeah right okay um, and someone else also asked, are there plans for kind of pushing that distribution of the business going forward, like giving kind of plans or licensing or training to governments and municipalities, kind of seeking out those partners that might actually do some of the distributed work? Um, let me put it this way. We are open to that, and, and uh, we, but we are also a company and we have investors and they, they want to protect their investment. Um, Again, it's 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 a financial issue, right? It could it could be, um, you know, if if we get bought and and we we could we could open sources, but I don't think it will solve the problem because our strength is not what we have now. Our strength is how fast we will have the next generation. That's what this company is made for, and right. and this is what we need to keep up. Got it. Okay. Um, one of the questions we also got was, um, do you need to work with government? So like, for example, with Orca, did the Icelandic government have to play a role in getting that project off the ground? Uh, yes, we work with governments and, and yes, these are infrastructure projects. I, I won't say big ones now, but they, they, I guess they are. I mean, it is for Iceland um, and we aim for bigger. So yeah, yeah, obviously the, the Icelandic government is very supportive and, and they understand that this is also an economic opportunity. I think this is slowly but surely sinking in is that this is probably one of one of the biggest economic opportunities because it it needs to become a trillion dollar industry in order to solve the climate problem and and not just direct air capture right everything in in in, in the removal space in addition to to opportunities in mitigation so it's not about burden sharing it's about opportunity sharing and and in a world where very many industries need to decline emitting industries in order to solve the problem here's one that must grow so hey i mean it's that that's the issue and yeah it, uh, countries waking up to that absolutely okay um another one of the questions we got was just about sort of the energy input required for dac and in particular you know if you're thinking about using renewable energies to run a lot of this how does that look over time um you know in the midterm when you're scaling up and renewed renewable energy may not actually be able to meet the demand how do you think about that as that goes forward um, well, I know in the reports and in very in the thinking of many policymakers, renewable energy is a fixed amount, but it is it's it subscribes to the laws of supply and demand, right? Like everything else. And if you talk to specialists in the field, for example, there's a professor in, in Finland called Christian Breyer, and he calculates 100% renewable energy systems with models that are a lot more sophisticated than integrated assessment models. Um, and and but if you listen to him, he's his models show very clearly that 100% renewable energy and some more on top for direct air capture is doable. It's the same question as with things like direct air capture. Will we get a move on fast enough, strong enough to solve the problem? But, but yeah, the story of us only works with the story of renewable energy. If I want to be provocative, I always tell people we have to leave the age of cavemen and stop digging our energy and, and materials out of the ground and turn to the sky like nature does, it's, it's, it's not, no difference, right? We get our raw materials from the sky, we get our, our uh, energy from the sky and, and we close the clouds out. Makes sense, yeah. Um, cool. And then we got a couple of questions about business models. So I think you talked a bit about like future business models and how that might evolve, but maybe just for people who don't already know, could you just like lay out the existing business model and what kind of customers you typically have? Yeah, sure. So we started niche, so we started with, um, to for for um, greenhouses for fertilizer that's a common practice and then you you swap the fossil for the for the atmospheric um, uh, then fizzy drinks so Coca Cola Switzerland is a customer 
um, those are tiny markets, right? The, the fizzy drinks market globally is 30 million tons. So, so that only takes you so far. And then you go into kind of bigger markets where the price is slightly lower. Uh, that's kind of the thing. So, so maybe the next would be aviation fuels in, in mm -hmm. very far away airfields where you have to fly it in instead of flying it in, you make it there. And that could close, close the difference in price. Um, but, but let me put it this way. If, if, if policy doesn't come in, um, our founders will be rich and so will, and our investors will be happy, but we don't solve the climate problem. Right. It needs to be bigger and quicker. So the, 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 the bottleneck is speed and scale up. We need 60% per year in order to solve the problem. Yeah. And electric car scale at 50 in recent years. So, so it's doable, but it's a tall order. Yeah, I think, I mean, I guess that kind of leads into another question, which was, um, you know, what to get to gigaton scale, I guess you're saying is a question of policy supporting it. Um, it's not necessarily going to happen on its own, right? It's a question of, of, of we see it as a question of, of uh, individuals, companies and governments all, you know, realizing or enough, enough of them realizing that direct air capture has to be a part of this uh, journey. Yeah. Okay. And are there like particular use cases you see scaling up in the future more than others? I would say aviation fuel for sure, because there's no, no alternative. And, and if you take it from a fossil point source, the CO2, I mean, you, you have a, a very big process that takes a lot of energy, more than you get out of it, but you still have an emission because you use the CO2 twice and emit it. So it has to come from the air. And then again, it's the same story, either it's biomass or it's, it's, it's DAC or, or you know, other, yeah. other ways. Well, there's, there's basically only DAC and Um uh, so, so yeah, th that's one big one. And then plastics, a, a hydrocarbon chains, basically, replacing all the yeah. gas. Totally makes sense. And I think we at Open Air, obviously, we're quite interested in a particular use case around concrete. We've kind of worked on some bills in New York and other states uh, getting sort of low embodied concrete bills passed. Um, what do you think about the use case for DAC and concrete in particular? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've looked, that was the first thing I was advocating for. Uh, Chris, Chris, Chris Nidal knows that because concrete gives you a super cheap sink, right? You don't have to drill a hole and, and you, can, you can use CO2 in building materials and because houses usually stand long enough. So I think the average in Europe is 90 years. Um, that's a long enough sink right and, and if we haven't solved the climate crisis in 90 years that, that that's a big problem so and it's also a kind of a decentralized market where many many business models and, and could spring up and, and many many startups to use the co2 um and even you know if you even if you take fossil co2 here you 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 have the storage for avoided emissions so yeah it's a great it's a great area and i think it's a two billion is it a two billion ton market globally? So it's quite significant too. Yeah. Yeah, are there any other big and sort of decentralized cheap sinks like concrete that we could also think about? Um, I think concrete is probably the biggest. So, so I would start with high, high price and low volume. So that's diamonds, right? And then you go down the, yes. the price chain and you end, end probably end with concrete. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Okay, yeah, thinking about the price versus volume. Um, cool. Well, just to finish up, what can activists who are pro DAC and kind of want to get this moving uh, actually do concretely to help get this out there? Um, uh, okay, so I think the first thing is, so I'm, I'm answering this for the US, I guess. So, so I think the first thing is, and obviously for other parts of the world, but the, the, the first thing is educate policymakers about the difference between CCS and CDR. So between fossil point source capture and things like direct air capture, so carbon removals. Yeah. Fossil point source capture is not cleaning up the atmosphere. It's avoiding that more CO2 gets into it. Yeah. Okay. So that's the big one. That's a very big one. Second one I will say is moral hazard. Um, you know, it's not, we don't need a 10 year discussion for it. You split the goals, you be as, as kind of ambitious as you can with emissions reduction. You have scientists, they can tell you what, where it should go. You put in a safety margin, let's say 85% reductions or 90% reductions, 15, 20% removals. Yeah. That to me makes sense. Um, 
and then it kind of is the, the third big one is realizing the difference between bio-based and 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 technical so technical safe technological like very safe safe space so why don't we just plant trees is one of the top three questions we just discussed that in in the, in the session before we had this, this webinar so we need to plant trees but we don't have enough space to just plant trees so that's a, that's the third one and then it's LCAs, so all of these nice things I've told you just show up in a cradle to grave LCA, so applicate cradle to grave and, and not cradle to gate, so wide systems boundaries. Um, and then the last one is, is certificates and standardization. If we, if we make a, excuse the word, shitty standard, um, we, you know, it won't solve the problem. So yeah. th those four things in mind is, is the strongest weapon to advocate. And then, and then six, sorry, um <laughs> the, the, Always more. In, in the in the west the pistols had six bullets so so i'm allowed it for one more um there you go. so the, the the last one is i would say um how can i put this yeah don't don't get fooled by the perfect policy mechanism don't go for the kind of super high carbon tax it's not gonna happen go for policy designs that are that you can get through where you can get the majority and have them now or, or in a week and not in 20 years even if they're not perfect and that's a that's a hard thing to balance right so yeah yeah absolutely Those will be my six bullets all right i like it six points for duck success um cool thanks so much Gustav. that was really interesting for me and i'm sure for everyone based on the chat that's been flying around um i'm gonna hand it back to toby just to close this out but thanks so much thank you Mega. Um, yeah, that was great. I love the presentation and um, also the six point checklist. I think we need to record that and memorialize it and uh, put it up on a wall somewhere. Um, but uh, Christoph, thank you again for your time. We know you're super, super busy and, um, and we really appreciate you being with us today. So thank you. That was fantastic. Um, we're actually off next week, but on the 19th, we have a very interesting early stage company called Mars Materials that is developing a potential sink like concrete. Um, they have a process that basically takes CO2 and turns it into a chemical whose name I cannot remember right now, but that can be used to make carbon fiber and long life along with plastics that can be used in the built environment. So very small now, minuscule, but something that could potentially scale up, um, not like concrete, but uh, to be a distributed use of CO2 that, that, that also um, involves permanent sequestration. Um, the 26th, we have Project Vesta, um, coastal carbon capture, which is very interesting. And they're looking to do some work here in New York State, which we're excited about. And then November, December, we have kind of an all-star of the CDR space, running side, uh, charm, uh, planetary hydrogen, NOAA, and seed change coming up. So lots of great events coming up on um, this is CDR. There should be links in the chat to follow us on Twitter. And um, I think Chris has put a couple links in the chat if you want to go to our website. Um, Open Air operates on a Discord server, and that's how we communicate. So you can sign up for that and join us. And there are tons of like really great advocacy efforts distributed increasingly all over the world that we need tons of help with, and we'd love to have you involved. But um, most of all, thank you again, Christoph. I'm sorry you missed the um, movie premiere, but we are very grateful for you being with us here and have a lovely evening. Um, and have a great day, everyone. Um, thank you so much.